Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Penny Ballum, and I'm the chair of the Vancouver Coastal Health Board of Directors, and I'm really delighted to be your host tonight for this open board forum. Welcome. During our time together this evening, we will share with you information about a number of exciting projects underway to improve health services in Richmond. Our board of directors and senior leaders are here tonight to deliver these updates, but also to hear from you about your experiences with VCH, your thoughts about our health services and how we can do better. We welcome any questions you may have on any topic related to the work VCH does in your community. Before we hear from our speakers, I'm just going to explain to you how a telephone town hall works. We want to hear from you tonight and you can get in line to ask a question at any time by pressing star three on your phone keypad. You will then be connected to an operator who will take down your question. They will check if you want to ask it live yourself or have us read aloud and put you in the line for the question and answer periods that will happen throughout the call. Please try to keep your question brief. There are a lot of people on the line and we want to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. We will also be asking you questions in the form of quick polls throughout the event that you can answer just tapping on your phone. The Board of Vancouver Coastal Health is very committed to ensuring that you as Richmond residents and those who are joining us from other parts of Vancouver Coastal are getting the kind of care you need. And shortly we'll hear updates on important healthcare topics in Richmond, including updates on the Richmond Hospital redevelopment, primary care services, community care services, and mental health services, as well as a very important discussion on public health priorities for Richmond and Vancouver Coastal. I'm here to keep this conversation moving smoothly and to make sure we get to as many of your questions as possible. I just wanna remind you that at any time, if you want to get in the lineup for asking a question, please press star three on your phone and we will take your question and put you in the lineup. To make our event more accessible, we are also providing multilingual support during the question and answer portions of our event. Our interpreters will now provide a brief overview of the session to our Mandarin and Cantonese speaking participants. Lunhan 您可以随时在电话上按星号和三键。接线员会将您接通到翻译。翻译人员会将您的问题用英文提出。感谢您参加董事会开封论坛。我们期待和您交流讨论。下面请粤语翻译做介绍。Over to you, Christine. 大家好,多谢你参加温哥华英文卫生局的公开论坛。今天的会议由董事会主席 Hong 
见。于是乎，将会啊，即系通到啊，你讲嘅语言嘅翻译，翻译人员会将你嘅问题用英文提出。多謝你參加董事會開放論壇，我哋期待可同你嘅交流同埋討論。Back to you, Dr. Bellum. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, I am Dr. Penny Bellum, the Vancouver Coastal Health Board Chair, and I'm very excited to be your host for this Open Board Forum. I would like to recognize that today is Pink Shirt Day. A national event in Canada encouraging all Canadians to take a stand against bullying. The theme this year is lifting each other up, and Vancouver Coastal Health is proud to support this annual event. Something that is so important for all of our public, especially our youth, and for our staff. By recognizing diversity and celebrating what makes us unique, we are working hard to promote a culture of mutual respect and belonging. For all of the public who access our services, and for all those who work in our organization, as we get started, it is important to recognize this open board forum is being conducted on the traditional, unceded homelands of the Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I would also like to note that Vancouver Coastal provides care on 14 unceded traditional territories of the First Nations. The Helpsick, the Kitasu Sheshe, Lilwat, Musqueam, the Kwakwa, Newhawk, Samaquam, Seashelt, Katine, Squamish, Plamen, Glaywatooth, Wickenau, and Shatsa. So we are extremely grateful to have the privilege of working and providing services to our public and many of us living. On the unceded territories, and just thank our First Nations partners for the privilege of doing that. Before we get to our public health update, I would like to welcome Mac Paul from the Musqueam First Nation, who will provide us with an opening welcome. Over to you, Mac. The Nasiya. Kawasotin Kwanisquish e Tanitsun Kumasquiam. I turn ash quawin quinsi quitnala. Meet set quat huiram e tana shmasqui march tamo tash amit tasant minum kan. Meet send kilt them nasia ya quant hank minum kan. Sasutu i quas quawin. Ia tawat sen kuat kita kita tahu. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kuala Sultan.、Uh, my English name is Mac Paul, and I'm from Musqueam.、Um, I'm honored to be here on behalf of my community, our elders, and our leadership、uh, to open today's forum、uh, in a good way by speaking my traditional language of Hunkmina. Um, Vancouver Coastal Health、uh, operates、um, on our traditional and unceded territory. So I would like to thank them for creating space for me to do this important work.、Um, I would just like to also、uh, recognize the theme or that you mentioned to lift each other up.、Um, we created shirts. The one they're wearing today it says "Setsuito,"、uh, and it means Uh, to help one another, so I thought that was kind of fitting and it kind、Great. of matches. Yeah,、um, and we created them obviously for Pinchard Day too. But thank you for having me and、um, enjoy. Thank you so much, Mac. It is really a privilege to have you here to open our evening together, and we will be taking every opportunity to collaborate with our First Nations partners to create a culturally safe healthcare system. For Indigenous peoples, and we're deeply committed to working together with our Indigenous partners on that process, and indeed creating a culturally safe healthcare system for everyone that we serve. And we know that the learning that we're doing with our First Nations partners is helping us be a better, be a better organization and create better health services. 
So just to remind everyone on the line, if you're joining us, welcome. A reminder that you can press star three on your phone at any time to join the line to ask a question. Now we're gonna do our first poll to start off the night. And this is, this is a system where we get to put a question up and have everyone who's participating provide us their answer. And these polls provide a high level snapshot of your perspectives on healthcare priorities for Richmond and Vancouver Coastal, including some that we will be discussing this evening. Polls are one of the ways we receive input from our public amongst other very many other processes to engage with our local communities, our indigenous community, the broad public and staff and medical staff who work in Vancouver projects and programs. So I'm going to ask a question and read out four answers. And you can choose the one that best reflects your thinking and your opinion by pressing the number on your phone keypad that corresponds with your answer. Please listen to all of the answers before you make your selection. So here's the question. What aspect of the provincial overdose crisis, the opioid crisis, and the new decriminalization of personal possession of opioids do you want to have more information about? Would you like to know, number one, for what the new decriminalization policy does? or press two for the impact that decriminalization will have on overdoses, or press three for what decriminalization means for Richmond residents, or press four for what supports and services are available to help people who use substances. Again, the question is, what aspect of the provincial opioid overdose crisis and the new decriminalization policy for personal possession, do you want more information about? Press one. Your answer is for what the new decriminalization policy does. Press two for the impact that decriminalization will have on overdoses. Press three for what decriminalization means for Richmond residents. Or press four for what supports and services are available to help people who use substances. Thank you so much for voting on this question and we will have the results of the poll for you in a moment. But first we will hear from our first speaker who is Dr. Mina Dewar, one of our medical health officers, a public health leader who will share information about public health priorities and we'll be addressing some of these topics on decriminalization and the overdose crisis. And then we'll turn the meeting back over to you for some questions before our next speaker. Remember, press star three on your phone keypad at any time to join the line to ask a question. And Dr. Dewar, just before you start, here are the answers to our first poll. So 9% of our participants wanted to know more about what does the new policy do? What does it mean? 24% wanted to know what impact is this new policy going to have on overdoses? 25% of our participants want to know what does it mean for Richmond residents? And 42% want to know what supports are going to be available for people impacted by this. So I'm going to turn it back to you, um, Dr. Dewar, and thank you. Um, thank you to all our participants for sharing your opinion on this really important question. And our public health team, as you'll hear, is working hard on this issue. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Dewar, who can fill you in in a much better way. So over to you, Dr. Mina Dewar. Yes. Thanks very much. Good evening, Dr. Penny Ballum, board members, Mr. Paul. Thank you for opening the session and Richmond residents. Tonight, it is my pleasure to provide an update on the new provincial policy or decriminalization framework that permits possession of illicit substances. This is one important step of many that is being taken to respond to the illicit drug toxicity crisis. As many of us are aware, the provincial overdose crisis was declared a public health emergency in 2016, 
And since then, over 11,000 British Columbians have died prematurely due to the toxic drug supply. While there were gains made in 2019, unfortunately with the pandemic, the crisis has worsened with 2,272 um, premature deaths among BC residents last year alone, including 28 in Richmond. The response to the crisis remains multifactorial with investments in youth programs, harm reduction, treatment services throughout Vancouver Social Health, including in Richmond. One of the critical elements of the response is a new provincial policy. What this policy means is that the provincial government has received a three-year exemption from the federal government to the Controlled Sub Drugs and Substances Act, such that adults 18 years and older will not be arrested, charged, fined, ticketed, or have their drugs seized if they possess small amounts of certain illegal drugs for personal use. The policy came into effect January 31st, and so we're now in the first few weeks of implementation. The policy as mentioned applies to adults 18 and older and includes possession of opioids, crack, um, cocaine, methamphetamines, and MDMA or ecstasy at or below two and a half grams. The, this amount is a base amount or threshold floor, and above this amount, the police can and are encouraged to use their discretion. Of course, there will be close scrutiny and evaluation of this policy by both provincial and federal governments. There has been broad support of this policy by both public health and police officials in British Columbia. So the question is, what does remain illegal? And um, and uh, I, I want to tell you that decriminalization does not legalize drugs, as was the approach taken with cannabis, or as we know, um, the approach to alcohol or tobacco. Selling or trafficking of drugs remains illegal. Giving away or supplying of these substances also remains illegal. Production of drugs remains illegal. And the policy is focused on keeping youth safe. So possession of any amount of illegal substances by adults, including the four mentioned above, on or um, close to school grounds and childcare, is not permitted. The drugs can also be um, transported across provincial or international boundaries. And finally, use in motor vehicle or watercraft is not permitted. Based on the experience of other jurisdictions which have, uh, who, uh, that have pursued these uh, policies, it's not expected to lead to an increase in drug use, which can sometimes be a concern of individuals. What the policy will do is it will decrease drug seizures, arrest criminal charges, convictions, meaning it'll decrease the harms for individuals who have a chronic health condition. Instead, police will now uh, provide resource cards or information and voluntary referral to healthcare, harm reduction services, and treatment support in the community. So what this policy offers is an important shift in our approach to substance use as a health matter rather than a criminal justice issue. Shame associated with stigma, both internal uh, that individuals may have or external from society, and criminalization can drive people to hide their drug use and use alone. Given the increasingly toxic drug supply, using alone can be fatal. So the objective of this policy is to break down barriers that prevent people from accessing support and treatment. There were many harms associated with criminalization. People who have their drugs taken away are at a number of immediate risks, including a withdrawal if they can't find replacement drugs, of having to find, uh, find the funds, often through unsafe means, to procure more drugs, or the drugs they may purchase may be more unsafe than the ones they already had. There's also the worry of being stopped, searched, and charged if found to be in possession of substances. We've heard from many individuals that they're afraid to call emergency medical services um, if they were to be faced with an overdose uh, because they're worried that they may be charged or have their drugs taken away. So criminalization has, has been a real barrier to accessing support. There's also the long-term harm of criminal charges because no one really wants a criminal record that will affect their ability to get education, employment, or travel once they're able to turn their life around. We hope that the policy may contribute towards a reduction in overdoses, but the greatest impact will be on reduction of criminal charges, harms associated with the justice system, and of course, uh, the biggest of all will be, uh, we hope, a reduction in stigma. 
The policy has been brought in following significant consultations with partners, um, including people with lived experience, and, and from public health and policing in British Columbia. With regards to the question about impact on Richmond residents, the policy will have no implication for a majority of Richmond residents. Um, for the most part, Richmond residents will not notice any change. But what we do hope is that this policy will enable vulnerable individuals who are faced with this health issue to come forward so we can help them be safe in the moment and we can support them when they're ready to engage in care. So in this point, I, I want to reiterate that this policy is one crucial part of a response to the illicit drug toxicity crisis in Richmond as reflective of BCH and the province investments to harm reduction, outreach, and treatment, both for mental health and addictions have increased over the last couple of years. And I have colleagues here who, who will be happy to provide further information on, on those services in the question and answer period. So Dr. Ballum, I'll stop here. I'm sure um, callers will have questions about the policy and we can field them now or later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dewar. Really appreciate um, the update on this really important topic. And in a few minutes, we'll hear an update on other healthcare projects and services. But first, we'd like to answer some of your questions. So uh, I've got a question from Andrew. Have you considered having pharmacists distribute drug testing strips as they already distribute Narcan to the public? This way, a person from Richmond would not have to go down to 888 Hastings to get their drugs tested. That's a good question. Can I uh, pass that off to Wonder Patty, Dr. Daly, if you, or who was that? Um, Dr. Dewar, go ahead, please. Yeah, sure. We can start off in Richmond, and I'm sure Dr. Daly can provide an um, answer for the rest of the health authority. Um, so, so, Andrew, thank you very much for your question. I, I want to reassure you that harm reduction supplies are widely available in Richmond, as they are in the rest of the Health Authority. Um, uh, and, and a number for community locations, VCH community locations in Richmond, um, as well as the ED. Of course, people shouldn't have to come to the ED for these services, but they're widely available, again, at 8100 Granville and Ann Wogel Clinic. Um, so that folks can get um, injection equipment, safe injection supplies, um, including um, the naloxone kits as well as the drug testing strips. Um, uh, I know my colleague Brittany Graham is here from um, uh, Vancouver Coast Health uh, Richmond Services, and, and she can add to this answer as well as Dr. Daly. Maybe I'll pass it to Brittany. Sure, and just to add to um, uh, you know, what you're talking about with the drug testing strips, I think it's important for everyone in Richmond to know that our MHSU sites are, are open and safe places for people to come. Um, and we do our best to meet folks where they're at. And I think um, that's our approach for everybody. Um, and Richmond has got a really great continuum of services to, um, to address the mental health and substance use issues that we see in our community. Thanks so much, Brittany. And just to remind our participants, please press star three on your phone at any time if you want to ask a question. So let's see. So I've got a question from Dorothy. Dorothy, you want to ask your question live? Terrific. Go ahead. Yeah. Dorothy. Hi there, Dorothy. Are you there? Do you want to ask your question or I can read it out? You can read it out. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. So the question is, I had home care support for over 15 years. Why are there such inconsistencies in the women that attend? The staff rotates and have to start over for home care, worn out by this process. What can be done about this, about maintaining consistent staff? So I'm looking for Shannon. Go ahead, Shannon. Shannon Hopkins, Hi. our our Chief Operating Officer for Community. Hi, Dorothy. Thank you for the question. It's a really important question, and we really do know how important it is uh, for people to have consistent care um, when they're receiving home support. It is something that we are continuing to try to improve, 
and, um, and ensure that our home support workers do have um, uh, people that they can visit on a consistent basis, basis as we know that is uh, what our people in the community would prefer. It's an ongoing um, uh, problem for us as we uh, endeavor to continue to hire staff and that continuity comes with more staff. So it, it's a process of improvement that we're working on. It's a good question, thank you. Thanks so much, Shannon. Thank you so much, Dorothy, really appreciate it. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone to press star three if you have a question. Our next question up is from Daisy. Decentralized specialized care, in brackets, emergency, oncology, et cetera, makes it difficult for family members. Any plans to re-centralize care to help bridge specialized areas so communication and care is a complete picture? Maybe I'll scale here. Who have we got up? Pass that to Gail. Thank Maybe. you. Yep, there you go, Gail, thanks. Um, I'll start with it. So um, usually what happens is our, the primary care um, providers, the one that really um, bridges all your special specialist appointment and all your care, but it is a bit of an issue if you don't have a primary care doctor. So we're working really hard in Richmond to improve the access to primary care so everyone is attached and has someone to coordinate that care for everyone. It's complicated, our healthcare uh, system. So it's a really good question. So we are working hard at doing that. Shannon, I don't know if you wanna add anything to what we're doing for primary care. Just to reiterate that we are working really hard on building our primary care uh, networks and really do recognize the value of people having uh, access to primary care. And it's something we're working hard at in uh, partnership with this government. Great, thanks so much, uh, oh, Shannon Hopkins, who is the um, chief uh, or the vice president of community services in Richmond, and Gail Malenstein, who's the vice president of the Richmond Hospital, the acute services in Richmond. So from Noel, Noel, you want to ask your question live. Terrific, you go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, um, I have a question. I just wonder if um, VCH has ever studied other like countries' um, strategy, like Singapore have an anti-drug strategy, work very well, and they are one of the lowest rates of drug abuse in the world. Um, for the discriminalized uh, policy, I just wonder, would it be affecting the youth in the community, giving them a signal that it's okay to take a small amount of drugs because it's not criminalized um, by the law? And I just wonder, would it be a good way to educate our youth not to even tick or try it? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, thanks so much, Noel. It's, it's a really great question um, for all of us who are parents. So, uh, Dr. Dewar, do you want to take that one? Maybe I'll start, and, and then I'll uh, allow Dr. Daly, who's a regional lead, to comment on other jurisdictions. So, um, so Noel, thanks for your question. I, I do want to reassure you that, that we, we want to protect our youth, and, uh, and there are prevention programs in place and in school and in community that, um, uh, through the education system, as well as that support uh, parents and families on how to talk about drug use and, uh, with youth. Um, um, so, so that's an important aspect of the program for us. Um, Dr. Daly, do you want to talk about our review of other jurisdictions? Sure, thank you very much. And thank you for the question, Noel. I'm Patty Daly. I'm the Chief Medical Health Officer, and I, I really appreciate the focus on youth. Dr. Brower and I are, are, are prevention physicians, and we, we want to prevent harmful substance use. That's really our primary goal. Of course, now we're responding to this terrible crisis. But we know that the reasons why people uh, have addiction are very, very complex, and they vary across societies. In British Columbia, uh, we know, for example, that Indigenous people, due to our history of colonialism, are at much higher risk of uh, illicit drug toxicity death than the rest of the population. That's through the intergenerational trauma, residential school systems. Uh, that, of course, did not exist in other countries. We know that that, that many people with, with addiction had uh, emotional or physical trauma in early childhood. We know that there are many people who 
uh, uh, became addicted to opioids because they had uh, acute or chronic pain. And in fact, we know among those dying that, that men are overrepresented. And many of those men have worked in the trades or the construction sector. They may have been injured. They may have felt they had to get back to work and they took painkillers and became addicted. So it's complicated. There's not a single reason why British Columbia in particular is, is affected by this crisis. But we do know that every jurisdiction is different. Uh, what we do know about the policy we've introduced, uh, as Dr. Dwyer said, is that uh, other places, Portugal, some other places around the world, have already decriminalized illegal substances, and they did not see a rise in drug use. And we also know, in, even in our view of uh, legalization of cannabis, that that has not led to a rise in use drug use. So we in public health don't want people to use any substance in a harmful way, whether it's illegal, whether it's legal alcohol or tobacco, and we'll continue to focus on youth and that very important upstream prevention. But this policy in particular is for those people who already suffer addiction in whom uh, criminalization is very, very harmful to them. It, it, it dramatically increases their risk, for example, of overdose death. So it's going to be very, very closely evaluated. Uh, there's going to be indicators that will be put in place. It's a three-year pilot project, and we'll be expected to report both the provincial and federal governments on on the policy, but it's broadly supported by public health, by police. And you know, we, as we look around the world, we do think this is best practice in places that have done a good job in addressing this kind of crisis. Thanks so much, Dr. Daly. Thanks, Dr. Dewar. And, and thank you, Noel, for that question. So I'm going to go to Del Rey, um, who is also going to uh, ask her question live. Go ahead, Del Rey. Hello, thank you very much. And, and good evening to the board. This is Del, I am Delray Butler. I had the opportunity um, this month to be in a post-op ward, I guess opportunity, for six days on Three uh -huh. North. And I, I developed a concern that I'd heard from others, but I saw the concern. And I interviewed an ad hoc group of about six people four nurses and three cleaners. The issue is the um, garbage and the dirty floors, the cleanliness of the floors, um, and that the nurses are needing to clean the beds and often clean up mess because there's not enough staff to help them. And I, well, cleaning staff has, was increased during COVID and I understand this cut back or people quit often, so that people are short staffed. Nurses appear to be short staffed too every night because um, they're explaining to me that probably burnout and everybody is working flat out. I would, I'm just interjecting that I found everything to be excellent, the nurses, were excellent. Everything was excellent. What was not excellent was the cleanliness of the floors. Bathrooms were kept clean and there was always spillages from tubes and everything else and messes that the, the cleaning staff has to run and clean. Therefore, the main halls um, do, the garbage is around on the floors and left for a couple of, it's not, anyway, I thought it was very discouraging to look at and I was walking constantly as part of my therapy so I got to see it night and day. I must interject that Thank 20 you. years yeah. before, two, I just want to say before 2001, before it was contracted out by the Liberal Party, the floors were absolutely clean and shining in hospitals. And when you walked in, you noticed that. And there was a perception of cleanliness, and it was clean. I was in there as working and as a visitor to my parents. 20 years, 22 years later, there's garbage on the floors. Um, garbage is not picked up until it's absolutely full every night. And the floors in the halls are filthy. And that's because okay. they're short staff, I think. I'm wondering Thank you if so much, Delray. Yeah. 
Go ahead. I, I thought what I would do is thank you so much You're for taking your a survey question. Maybe I can. No, no, I, I just, it for uh, me. pass it. <laughs> no, I think you were very clear in your question, and I was going to ask if um, Gail Malenstein, who's the VP of um, Richmond Acute, can just speak to this. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bellum. Um, Delray, I hope you're recovering after your surgery, and thank you. Um, so we have just brought back in our housekeeping staff um, last fall. So they are our employees now. So we're just still working through that process to get everyone organized and bring the management back in. But we will, going forward, have more control over that. So we're hoping things will improve um, for that. And yes, staffing is an issue, obviously, in our nurses and housekeeping. But we're doing everyone, we're doing everything to recruit and to retain our staff because they're all really important to us. Thank you so much, Del Rey. Um, really appreciate you sharing your experience. And um, I'm going to move on to Lynn. Lynn, you are going to um, present your question live as well. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Um, sure. And um, please, you're just, in just well, just a sec, Lynn. I'll, I'll, Okay. I'm just going to ask the participants, don't forget to press star uh, star three on your phone if you want a question. And go ahead, Lynn. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, okay. Your original question was uh, about uh, decriminalization. And um, you um, made a note that supports were, were available in, in the Richmond area. Uh, my question to you is, do you have supports for drug users who wish to choose detox and recovery? It sounds like through conversation you have safe supply and other harm reduction, but if um, a user wants to um, get off drugs, what supports do you have in place for that? All right, so is that Brittany? Are you going to take this one? Yeah, I can take this one. I'd be happy to. Um, Thank thanks so much, Lynn, for your question, and I think it's a really great question. Um, so I think in Richmond, uh, we've got a great continuum of services, um, which, yes, does include harm reduction, but at the other end of the harm reduction continuum is that um, folks that choose to detox completely and remain absent from substances, and we're ready and there to support them when they're, when they're ready to do that. So Richmond specifically, um, we have a number of programs. We have the ability to do um, a medical and mobile detox for folks. We do have connections with our Vancouver Coastal Health Detox Services. Um, and all of our substance use programs can um, support people in recovery. And, and of course, if that's what they choose and want to do, we're, we're right alongside them to help them do that. And thanks. And I assume, Brittany, there's lots of information on the website, correct, for our Richmond community of care? Yeah, I think um, what Richmond has had, what Richmond's developed in the past little while is actually one phone number that folks can call, um, which I'm happy to, to give sure. out or talk about later. Yeah. Um, so our one number is uh, an access point that folks can call and speak to a trained clinician to walk anyone through the best next step. Uh, for their own recovery uh, journey. And that's 604-204-1111. Um, and in addition to that, I should also add that uh, our substance use services do welcome walk-ins. Um, and so that's walk-ins at our Community Health Access Center, which is um, at 7671 Alderbridge Way. We also take walk-ins at our transitions program, uh, which is at 8100 Granville. And then finally, from the youth lens, we do uh, what's our wonderful new Witch and Foundry program that has opened in the last uh, year, uh, is there to support our youth that are ready to make that step. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Brittany. And thank you so much, Lynn. That's a great question. And I think I have this number, 604-204-1111. That's the number that to correct. call if, if you want to talk to a clinician or a family member or a friend needs help and wants to figure out with someone who's got expertise what their next step should be in recovering from their addiction. So that's great. Thanks, Brittany. Okay, we are, we're at the end of this particular question and answer period. It's not the end, though. There will be more. So just remember, 
as we go through this, star three on your phone is what you need to press to get in the lineup to either ask your question live or have me read it out. So I really appreciate everybody's questions and the great responses and we're, we'll get to more of them, but I wanna just do another poll question. So the poll question is, which healthcare topic in Richmond is most important to you? Press one for hospital care. Press two for primary care and family doctors. Press three for seniors care. Press four for mental health services and supports. So once again, which of the following Richmond healthcare priorities are most important to you? Press one, if it's hospital care. Press two for primary care and family doctors. Press three for seniors care. And press four for mental health services and support. All right, so we'll see. We'll bring back the results of that poll with you in a few minutes. And in the meantime, you know, I, I do want to, first of all, I, I want to say what a privilege it is for our board of directors to, to join me and our staff and all of you on this call and to hear your interest and questions, things that are concerning you. It's one of the ways that our board tries to stay in touch with the different communities that we serve over the large geography of Vancouver Coastal. I also want to thank, on behalf of the board and the senior team, the residents of Richmond, you have been incredibly generous in support of the Richmond Hospital and contributing to the Richmond, Richmond Hospital Foundation. Your foundation at the Richmond Hospital raises critical funds for us and brings awareness to different programs and opportunities that are coming to meet the health needs of residents of Richmond. And so I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us for your generosity and for your commitment to your hospital and your community and just thank you and keep it up it's terrific i also want to thank the many volunteers that work through the richmond hospital and the richmond hospital healthcare auxiliary we feel your impact daily i know i visit richmond hospital fairly frequently and i see the volunteers and the auxiliary members just about every time I'm there, and it's just so wonderful to see those community members being part of, you know, meeting the healthcare needs of the community. So I just really want to thank you. And finally, just a big thank you to all our staff, our medical staff, and everyone who goes above and beyond to deliver care and services. It's been a very, very difficult last three years in, in our, you know, in our world, as you all know, and Richmond. I can tell you stepped up and did a terrific job protecting yourselves with vaccination and helping us basically support our healthcare team and to help deliver the best care in their, under very challenging circumstances. So thank you, thank you to all of our community. So while we're waiting to get to the Richmond update, I'm just gonna give you your poll results. So the hospital care 32% of you said hospital care was the most important issue um, in your community. Primary care and family doctors tied with hospital care. That's good news for 32% of the participants. 28% most important thing was seniors care and 8% the most important thing mental health supports. So thank you for that input. That's very important for us to understand these priorities. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gail Mallinston the Vice President of Richmond Acute, and Shannon Hopkins, the Interim Vice President for the Richmond Community, to provide an update on Vancouver Coastal Health Services in Richmond. Over to you, Gail and Shannon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Bellum. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gail, and I'm the Vice President for Richmond Acute Care Services here at Richmond. We have a lot of information to share with you tonight, so let's get started with the exciting news of the update on the Richmond Hospital Redevelopment Project. We are working hard to plan the new nine floor acute care tower called the Yurkovich Family Pavilion, which will add 113 new beds to the hospital. It will feature a, start, a state of the art emergency department and intensive care unit, as well as a fully equipped medical imaging department. There are four phases 
and we are currently in phase one. During phase one, we have been completing work to prepare for construction of the new tower. Teams throughout Richmond Hospital are being relocated to accommodate the park center and the rotunda to be um, demoed. Renovations are also in progress to provide interim space for programs vacating the rotunda. With an estimate completion set for late summer 2023. Construction is also underway on our new cancer care clinic, which will be completed this fall. The estimated completion of all four phases will be the winter of 2031. But we are hoping to open part of the Yurkovich uh, Family Pavilion in 2028. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Shannon Hopkins, who's the Intern Vice President for Richmond Community, to provide you with an update on the services available in our community. Uh, thank you, Gail, and good evening, everyone. I want to start off by acknowledging the impacts that COVID-19 has had on our healthcare system and the incredible work that is happening across the health authority to respond to those challenges while we continue to deliver quality care to the people of Richmond. These days, we know it can be difficult to find a family doctor. In Richmond, Vancouver Coastal Health is working with the Ministry of Health and the Richmond Divisions of Family Practice to expand primary care options. An example of this is the Richmond uh, City, uh, City Center Urgent and Primary Care Center, which moved into its current uh, permanent location in April, 2022. This is one of the busiest UPCC locations and we have built up a team of approximately 30 doctors, six part-time nurse practitioners, two social workers, and a team of registered nurses and office staff to support the delivery of care for people in Richmond. So with respect to community care, let's talk about the several key community services available in Richmond, beginning with long-term care. There are six long-term care homes in Richmond these homes include 880 publicly funded beds that provide 24 hour nursing and professional care for individuals who have complex health needs. We also have two assisted living residences and two adult day programs. All of these programs work to support individuals with complex medical conditions to safely live in the community. A business case has been developed to replace the former Richmond Lions Manor at the Fentiment site in Richmond. This purpose-built long-term care home will have approximately 150 beds. The business case for this redevelopment is currently under review and we look forward to sharing more details as the project moves forward. To help meet staffing needs and to provide training for the next generation of healthcare workers, we've also supported on-the-job learning for 69 students from the Healthcare Assistance Program. Recently, we have also added a consulting physician and a registered nurse team to work closely, closely with long-term care providers and home health clinicians to support timely access to resource, uh, resources and interventions like ultrasounds or x-rays, which enables quick access to address individual care needs and avoids uh, long waits and expedites treatment to re and also reduces pressure on the emergency department. A lot of work has been accomplished as we've, been, as we've learned more from the pandemic about how to keep long-term care residents safe. 100% of long-term care staff and 74% of residents received their full, vaccine, full booster vaccinations, and we continue to follow public health guidelines from screening staff and visitors to the use of personal protective equipment. With respect to home health and care transitions, we've been working to improve the delivery of both timely care and quality care, as referrals have continued to increase over the last five years. To support these efforts, we have formed a team to provide timely transitional support and care for complex home health clients who are being discharged from hospital to home. This team supports discharges over the weekend and evening. They connect with the discharge client, either in person or virtually, within 48 hours to ensure their transition home goes as smooth as possible. We care for many individuals in their home with a range of care needs, including wound care and chronic disease management. For clients with the most complex care needs, we are adding a team of clinicians who will have smaller assignments 
and they will provide intensive wraparound care to address individual care needs. They will also provide emotional support as required to those individuals within a client's care circle. With regards to home support services, we have, all, we have also seen an increased demand in that area. We've hired 12 graduates from the Health Careers Access Program and are currently recruiting for community care worker positions uh, enrichment. We have also increased the use of time limited 24 over 7 home support as part of our overall strategy to reduce the time that patients have to spend in acute care beds unnecessarily and improve timely discharge back to the comfort of their home. With respect to palliative and cancer care, I want to touch quickly on palliative care. We know palliative care and end of life care may not be familiar or comfortable conversations for some members of our communities. In response, the palliative team at Richmond Hospital started a Gift of Pearl campaign, which helps clinicians have meaningful conversations with clients around their care goals and advanced care planning. These, support, these supports are available at our care sites across the Richmond Community of Care. With respect to mental health and substance use support and services, and it, it, um, these services are, as you, as we have heard, an integral part of overall health and wellness. I first want to say that our hearts go out to those impacted by the devastating toxic drug crisis that we continue to see in our community, communities. There is a lot of work underway locally and across the province to save lives and address the crisis. A lot of work has been accomplished as we've learned more for the pandemic, Sorry, we continue to see many people who are experiencing mental health and substance use challenges. Our mental health and substance use programs are tailored to meet specific needs from dedicated programs for early childhood behavioral issues, right through to services for older adults and dementia. We've been working hard to respond to growing needs, and since the beginning of the year have added over 50 new staff to serve this community. We've expanded our services for children and youth, with more capacity for people with eating disorders, more integrated services with schools, and a special program for young people with psychosis. Our staff speak a wide range of languages and bring extensive cultural knowledge and sensitivity to their work. Boundary Richmond is a program that provides youth aged 12 to 24 access to a wide range of integrated services like primary care, counseling, mental health, and substance use supports all in one place and it's now open in a larger permanent location at 101 5811 Cooney Road. To find the right program for you or your loved one, you can call the Richmond Mental Health and Substance Use uh, Central Intake Line, as you've heard, at 604-204-1111. As we conclude the Richmond uh, Healthcare Updates, I want to thank our staff and our physicians for the outstanding care that they provide every day. I also want to thank the community for helping us to respond to the pandemic and for your ongoing and generous support through the Richmond Hospital Foundation. Gail and I look forward to continuing to work with our community partners to deliver quality health care needs for all residents now and into the future. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Shannon and, um, and Gail. That's really, really helpful. And we're, we're going to you know, move on now to um, asking, you know, getting some questions answered. Um, I want to remind everyone to press star three on your phone at any time if you want to ask a question. I think it's fair to say that there's been a lot of work done to improve care and the patient experience in Richmond. Uh, we're particularly gratified at the resources that have come to us through the government for investments in home support, um, new human resources, and also, most importantly, mental health and substance abuse. It's making a big difference for the community. We're very inspired and look forward to continuing to watch the progress of services in the community. So I'm going to get to our first question now on the line. And remember, press star three if you want to ask a question. And I have one from Catherine. What are they doing right now for hospital emergency wait times? It's at least five hours every time I go. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And I am going to pass that. I don't know. Gail, is that you or? Yeah. Yep, thank that's you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine, for the question. 
Yes, it's frustrating. Lots of work being done here at Richmond and regionally for hospital uh, emergency time. So we're doing a communication campaign um, so that people that don't need to come to eMERGE could go to the UPCC or their primary care. Within the hospital, we are trying to move people along very quickly. We've added some um, different clinicians to um, get people home safely, but more quickly with all the needs, all their needs met, whether it's home support or equipment. Um, so our times actually have come down in the last couple of months, but we still have some more work to do. No, whether Vivian, are you there? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thanks, Penny, and thanks, Gail, for your response. And I guess what I can say is that as a health authority, we have come together through um, um, as a regional um, operations team to look at our overall flow through in the hospital to support improved access to care, which also means improved um, experiences in our emergency department. So reductions in wait time, not only for um, patients who are being admitted into our hospital, but also for patients who are coming in for treatment and then being released. And as Gail has said, we're investing resources, um, not only in our emergency department, but throughout our hospital and in our community to improve the patient experience and improve access for all of our clients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Vivian is our CEO. Vivian Eliopoulos is CEO of Vancouver Coastal. So I have Bruce next. Uh, Bruce, you're going to come on live and ask your question about something that's very dear to my heart, making it easier to access your own medical record. So let's, Bruce, go ahead. Hi there. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we Hello? can. Okay, then. Yeah. We I can hear you, a... Bruce. Yep. Okay, I had a problem getting my medical records. Five years ago, I uh, filled out the forms to get my medical records. And in response, Vancouver Coastal Health sent me to a Dr. Michael Dowry, a psychiatrist, who wrote down some very interesting things in my record, including that I had been in prison. Even though I had been a professional security officer all my life, and had a valid security license at the time that he did this. Since then, I had not been able to get any medical assistance. I had been essentially blacklisted from all services and haven't been able to get my heart medication for the past five years. I'm just wondering what the source of this policy is and do you plan on carrying it down to Richmond? Okay, so thank you so much, Bruce. And I think what I might do is get um, us to get your number and we will get back to you and try and sort this out for you. Um, I think access to medical records is legislated, it's very clear. Um, the release of medical records is you know, something that we do all the time. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to suggest that we get your number from our operator and we will get back to you. Thank you so much. Um, do we have another question now? Okay, Teresa is going to come on live. Why don't you um, ask your question, Teresa? Thank you so much. You're talking about me? Teresa Lee? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes, but uh, my question yes. is coming I mean, actually from the first session. It's regarding the legalization of the, uh, like, a, like the, what is the, the um, legalization of the of the drug use, yes. And then I just wonder, do have we had really have done a lot of uh, like authentic scientific research uh, establishing the relationship that legalization really will help to dis decrease the overdose issue? Well, my yes. My okay, case. thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead. Sure, like your access to the uh, to the drug use is actually helpful to 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 resolve the issue. So yeah, it's just like right. uh, I'm, so, I'm still going back to the root 
of the the issue. I feel bad. Right. Uh, so I think this is the you guys already talking about the support and what kind of support is available instead of the uh, instead of the talking about uh, what is uh, whether we are in the right direction, whether this is the right approach. So this is my question. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. Teresa, I'm going to pass you to Dr. Patty Daly, our Chief Medical Health Officer. Thank you for that question, Teresa. That's a good question, and I can tell you that we spent a long time uh, researching uh, approaches to the the overdose crisis and decriminalization in particular. In fact, um, I was personally involved in a lot of that work with some of the experts. spent over two years looking at this. The other places that have decriminalized, probably the best known is Portugal. And they did not just decriminalize personal possession. They also invested a lot of other support providing treatment for people. And they saw a significant reduction uh, in both overdoses and other harms associated with drug use. But, but, but I think, and, and Dr. Dower mentioned this, we don't uh, expect that decriminalizing drugs, and we're not legalizing them, we're just decriminalizing it for those people uh, have a small amount of these substances for their personal use. They're not trafficking drugs. Don't necessarily expect it, at least in the short term, to reduce overdose deaths. Because these drugs are still toxic; they're still contaminated with fentanyl and other substances. But the hope is that if decriminalization can reduce the stigma associated with drug use, and that's been shown in other areas, that people will be more willing then to talk to their family members, their doctors, and others about their drug use to seek treatment. Right now, because it's illegal, because people are worried about being arrested, they aren't doing so. And if that occurs, and we should start to be able to uh, get people the treatment they need and reduce overdose deaths. But, but decriminalizing alone won't do that. Drugs are still toxic. It's just a first step to really take a public health approach to addiction and get it out of the criminal justice system. There's no evidence anywhere that decriminalizing will increase drug use. I think Dr. Dower mentioned that. So, so we will be closely monitoring it, but that's the, the goal and that's what the research tells Thank you so much, Dr. Daly. Um, and I am going to pass, we have another question from Debbie. And the question is, why has Richmond Hospital not received any MRI machines from Vancouver Coastal Health? The current MRI is 10 years old and was purchased by a donor. Our new one is also being purchased by a donor. Can we not get one from VCH so that we have two and cut down the wait time? Good question, Debbie. I'll pass that over to Gail Malenstein. Thank you, and thank you, Debbie, for the question. So um, you obviously know we're having our MRI um, replaced. It is, I think, 12 years old. So we are just doing work to put in a module um, a building to house a temporary MRI while we replace the one we have. Um, BCH looks across everyone in the wait list and MRI is now done, um, can be done centrally so you can go somewhere else. We probably are at the brink of needing a second one, but unfortunately we have no room here until we open our new tower. But the good news is we will have two MRIs when we open our new tower. We are also replacing our CT scanner while I'm on the subject. Um, and looking at getting a second CT scanner. Um, and also about the MRI, BCH actually was um, going to pay for it, but then a donor came forward and wanted to, um, and wanted to purchase it for us. So that's how um, it happened that a donor is now going to replace our, our, our um, MRI. Thank, thanks so much, Gail, and thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you to, again, to all the donors in our in the community of Richmond who have contributed so generously to the foundation. The foundation helps all, all of all our foundations help our um, our organization, you know, buy much needed equipment along with what we get from the government. So we really, really appreciate it. So our next question is from Terry. A great question, Terry. Can we have a centralized intake line for seniors to connect with home care services? I called before and it took three or four numbers to get to the right resource. So I'm gonna hand that to Shannon. 
Hi, Terry. Uh, thank you for the question. A very good question. And apologies that it took you three or four phone numbers to get to the right resource. Uh, I just really want to emphasize that for, for Vancouver Coastal Health, access to services is really a priority for us. So the notion of, of it taking a long time to get um, to uh, be able to figure out what kind of services you can access is, is something that we're working on. It's a priority. We do have a single line for home health services, and we are working hard actually to even improve that, that process across the health authority. So the number is 604-675-3644, um, uh, just so you have that as a reference. But again, um, being able to access services re really is a priority for us, and we're working hard to improve that. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thanks, Terry, for that question. Um, our next question, and just to remind everyone, if you want to ask a question, please press star three, and you'll get in our lineup. So from Sarah, what new programs are being put in place for youth mental health substance use? A more connected system is needed. So Shannon, I'm going to pass that one to you as well. Yeah, and I'm just going to uh, call on Greg who is the person in um, Richmond that is able to really answer that question. Greg, are you available to answer the question around um, the programs that are being put in place for the youth? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Sarah, for your question. Uh, so uh, actually in the past 18 months, we've, Richmond, uh, have um, sort of many new programs specific to youth uh, with many new positions uh, for those uh, programs. Uh, so I'll talk about a couple of them just to start off with. So the first one, uh, which was mentioned earlier, was Foundry. So Foundry is uh, really a one uh, location for youth to come in to seek uh, services, whether it's mental health, public health, um, uh, peer support services. So uh, again, that was mentioned earlier. It's located at 5811. Uh, Cooney Road. Um, Foundry Richmond, we actually started that uh, during the pandemic 2020 in the interim site and the new site uh, just launched um, uh, uh, last fall. Uh, one of the other programs uh, that started specifically for youth is uh, our Step Up, Step Down program. Uh, and that program essentially is to help individuals um, uh, essentially, you know, step down from any acute services like the emergency room, for example. Uh, so one question came up earlier is reducing wait times in emergency room. The Step Up, Step Down program specifically for youth is to help transition uh, youth uh, out of the hospital emergency room uh, more quickly um, and to connect them uh, uh, and bridge them, excuse me, more uh, appropriately with our community uh, programs. Um, and one other thing that was mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, an announcement was made a couple of weeks ago with the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions uh, is our integrated child and youth teams. And essentially that is taking our uh, current existing mental health and substance use uh, teams for children and youth and really having more integrated services uh, with the school district. So a number of new pro um, positions were uh, created for the ICY uh, uh, programs. Uh, again, taking our current our current programs and having more integrated system uh, with the uh, school district. So those are just a couple of the uh, new programs and positions that were created specifically for children and youth uh, in Richmond. Thank you so much, Greg. It's really great. The board is very happy to see new services coming on and the Foundry especially, which is such a great integrated service where kids can get just about anything they need, um, including mental health, obviously, and substance supports, but primary care and different kinds of counseling. So thank you so much. And thanks um, for the question. So our next question is from Tazzy. What is Vancouver Coastal Health doing about diversity and equity, specifically relating to meeting the needs of a diverse community in healthcare? A really important question, something that the board has um, engaged heavily in. We have a very, very diverse board um, at Vancouver Coastal. We're very proud of that. And equity and diversity and having a very robust strategy has been incredibly important to us. So I'm going to pass this over to Charlene Chang, who is leading our equity and diversity strategy for the organization. Charlene. Thank you so much. Um, I, all I can tell you is that we're working so hard to ensure that we're really advancing on our equity, diversity, 
and inclusion principles and practices. We have just recently completed a full survey, a self-identification survey with our staff and medical staff. We're 29,000 staff and medical staff at VCH who fed into what type of practices and principles should we be applying to our EDI principles and how do we roll out a really good equitable program across VCH to ensure that we have a very inclusive program for cultural safety that includes Indigenous cultural safety as well as other safety um, for all of our demographics for staff and medical staff also includes ensuring that our patients and clients feel very safe and supported in our environment. Thanks so much, Charlene. Um, appreciate that. And thank you so much for the question. So um, let's have a look here. So I've got a question from Sung. Um, coordination between this is a great these are great questions because these are the kinds of questions that the board asks of our staff on a regular basis this this one is particularly close to my heart coordination between hospitals and their family care what is richmond hospital doing to actively coordinate the communication of this information with the various health providers in other words how are we making sure that we hand off and communicate when people leave our hospitals or are, are admitted to hospital with families and with other health providers. So I am going to pass that one to Gail Malenstein. I think Shannon wants to take it. So maybe Shannon can start and then I'll add. Yeah. Okay, great. Think, okay, Shannon. I think, yeah, you know what? It's a partnership between acute and community. So it's a really, really good question, which is why Gail and I uh, both really need to weigh in on this. I think there's processes that Gail can speak to within the acute care setting about handing off that information, being really intentional about sharing information with the providers that are outside of the hospital. I guess what I'd like to speak to is just our efforts um, in community and our partnerships with acute to make sure that that transition out of acute, the acute care setting is smooth. We have a team dedicated actually, uh, as I mentioned in, in my little uh, blurb earlier, uh, to make sure that people, we follow up with people when they go home, to make sure that they have what they need to make a, a, a smooth transition. So ha, do they have their meds picked up? Is a caregiver available? All of those pieces that make a transition successful and smooth. So it's, and, and then the coordination with their primary care provider um, to make sure that we, we make that hookup when somebody is home and that the clinicians in the community also link and partner with the community care providers. So Gail, I, you may wanna just make a comment about the information. Yeah, so um, here at the hospital, um, physicians usually dictate and then that is sent to their primary care um, provider. Um, the nurses on the floor have a checklist and usually send um, with the family and the patient um, information about follow-up um, if they have to see their specialist or, or go and follow up with their um, uh, primary care doctor. It also has information about care if they've had surgery um, and obviously if there's a pres prescription. Um, so that happens on the floors with, with their um, next to kin and the patient. And then the physicians are notified where we get into a little bit of trouble is if um, the patient doesn't have a primary care to fax or to call to um, communicate the care that's happened in the hospital. But like Shannon says, um, community, especially if they have supports that are going in, that that communication goes through those clinicians. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, sorry. We had a little buzz out there. Um, thanks, Gil. Are you, is that, do you finish? Yeah, I am, great. thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for that little hiccup, everyone, a little technology. Um, I, I also just want to add to the whole issue of connections with, you know, not just primary care, but other other physicians, providers that are looking after um, your family members or your patients who are in our hospitals and transitioning home, that we, we have a lot of digital information now that it's much, much easier for our physicians, our primary care physicians to access through their electronic medical record in their office. And 
you know, I think things have come a long, long way to make sure they they are aware. And I think we have in place, as you've heard, some extra steps that we take to make sure the patient understands that and that they have their own information um, and that we, we remind um, providers in as many ways as possible that they're, they're, the people they're caring for are, are heading home and are going to need support. So thanks for that very important question. Now, I've got um, one from Stephen, a really good one about our frail um, individuals leaving hospital. Are there any plans for Richmond Hospital to have, again, a transitional care unit for people who might need more time and rehabilitation prior to going home? Would this space help ease pressure on home supports and prevent hospital readmission and hospital long hospital stays? So is I'll that it. Yeah, you go ahead, Gail, thanks. Thank you, and thank you for the question. So um, obviously you knew that we had a TCU, we've actually had two. So years ago, our TCU was located at Minaru, and then we moved it on to Three North, which it was there for uh, many years. One physician looked after the patients there, and then he, he semi-retired and we closed it because the uptake was not great there. Um, quite often, those beds weren't utilized by people needing rehab. But Shannon and I have just in the last couple of months started to talk about it again, because we do have access to um, acute rehab at GF Strong and Holy Family, but some people need a slower rehab. So it's, a, it's about space, actually. So we are um, investigating that and looking into it and pulling the data because we're always looking at ways to best support the Richmond residents. So um, good timing, more to come, and we'll certainly update you with that as, as we uh, um, go forward. Thanks so much, Stephen, uh, and thanks, Gail. Really appreciate that. Um, I have another question from Stanley. Are there any plans to open more urgent care centers for walk-in patients? And so I'm going to pass that over to Shannon Hopkins. Go ahead, Hi. Shannon. Hi, thank you, Stanley. A really good question. As you, as I mentioned earlier, our UPCC is is really very busy. Uh, so we are in the um, in the in the midst of um, opening or uh, building and planning for a an, an, an additional UPCC in um, East Richmond, and we expect that that'll be opening uh, towards the end of 2023. Um, so once that one's done, that will give us two, and then we will be looking to see if there's um, any opportunities within within the west side of the city as well. But we can tell you that uh, at this point, we know that we'll have one that's forthcoming by the end of, of uh, this year. That's the plan, the timeline. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thanks so much for that question, Stanley. Our next question, uh, let's see, it is from, hang on a sec here, uh, right here, having a little bit of trouble here, from Marion. Will the palliative care ward be enlarged as part of the reconstruction at the hospital? Over to you, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for the question. So at this point, no, there is no plans to enlarge the palliative care ward. Uh, we forecasted out to 2035 and um, our numbers didn't show we needed to increase it, but we're always looking, we still have five years. We have not, um, we have not settled on the bed map for the new tower, for the new um, units. So we will always look to see where we are and update that data as we go. Thanks so much, Gail. But maybe you can just remind us of how many new beds are going into that tower generally? Yeah, so we get another 113 new beds in that tower. Okay. See, okay, so who, what have we got here? So from Debbie, when you say that you are addressing the staffing shortage, what are some of the specific things you are doing and is there a five-year plan? I'll take oh, it. Yeah, I'll that's great, Gail. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's lots of work being done um, provincially, regionally, and certainly here at Richmond. So we are, um, you know, increasing our recruiting efforts, 
um, our retention, especially here locally. Um, you know, happy staff, they don't want to leave. So we're doing all kinds of things like um, appreciation lunches and teas, looking after their wellness. We just did a survey about well, what wellness needs to our staff. Um, we're also looking at um, the, pro the provinces, um, looking at um, uh, speeding up the international nurse process. So it used to sometimes take three or four years. So they're trying to cut some of the red tape to get the nurses into the country um, sooner. We're looking at um, jobs that maybe um, can be done by other people. Um, so lots of work being done. Um, the province does have a three-year plan for um, improving the HR. And um, yeah, we're all, like I said, there's those pillars that we're um, continuing to look at um, because it's a problem across the province and across the country. Great, thanks so very much, Gail. And another related staffing issue from Louise, what is being done to recruit more psychiatrists to lessen caseloads so that more people with mental illness, substance use can have the support and help they need? And I think I have Brittany. Um, Brittany, do you want to uh, start and then, uh, if we have uh, anybody else, you can just put your hand up for me. Go ahead, Brittany. Sure, thank you. And thanks, Louise, for the question. Um, so in general, BCH has a talent team that's dedicated to recruiting in general, um, and we're continually engaging with them um, in the mental health and substance use world. Uh, we're also engaging a lot with the support of our medical affairs team. And actually, over the past few years, we've been successful in placing additional psychiatry and addiction physician sessions in several of our uh, Richmond programs. Um, just even one example with additional psychiatry time to our rapid uh, access console clinic has reduced our wait list um, by over 50% just in the last year alone. Um, so we'll continue to work with that recruitment strategy because it's been effective and, and uh, something we look at on an ongoing basis. Thanks so much, Brittany. Um, I, I do know too that our Dr. Ashok Krishnamurthy, who is uh, one of our psychiatry leads, is, has also got you know a talent team specifically dedicated to trying to find more psychiatrists to come to Richmond. So it's very good news. We're very aware of the importance. Mental health has been a big issue um, that has really grown in terms of the community needs after the pandemic. So we're working hard to create more services as you've heard. Okay, so now my next uh, questioner is Noel. Noel, why do GPs have limits on accepting patients? It's very difficult to find a family doctor. And I don't know, Shannon, do you wanna take that question? Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you for the question, Noel. And um, in terms of GPs having limits on accepting patients, to be honest with you, that is a question I would have to ask. I was unaware that there's a limit in that regard. Maybe Cheryl, you're, are you able to, to answer that or is that something we would take offline and get back? No, we can't, we can't hear you. Sorry, Cheryl, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, yeah. well, I can answer being a physician. I, I can okay. give a little bit of insight into this. Um, you know, um, physicians usually have a, a set number of patients that they feel that they can manage their care appropriately. And so, you know, it, as, as physicians are entering into a, a new family practice, they will be recruiting patients and, you know, getting up to a level of patients on, on what we call their panel. Um, and they, they have different limits, um, different physicians, they work at different number of days per week, as you probably know, some of them do other things besides see patients in their office. So it is quite a mixed environment. And, you know, the government with the new primary care investment that they've made is is trying to set some, some appropriate limits um, where they must reach a certain number of patients if they're going to work full time. So I think there's, there's a balance and different physicians have a bit of a different approach. But the, the government is trying to set a, a specific minimum for a full-time physician. If you are working and you get to enter into the new primary care program that they've now 
funded that you will have to see a certain number of patients in your practice. And, and that will be balanced by how many are, you know, have very high needs versus, you know, some of our, our younger people who don't have to see their physician very often, but generally they're, they're trying to set, uh, you know, basically a threshold, which will be expected of all our physicians. We're very hopeful that this will make a difference to access to having a family doctor because we know how important that is. Okay, so um, we have, uh, we're gonna do one more poll question um, for, for the evening. You, all of you have asked such really terrific questions that are you know, just very insightful. They're very much the questions for healthcare that we're working on as, you, as you've heard. We don't have them land at all yet, but we're working hard on it. And you know, before I ask this poll, I just want to I just want to tell you the members of our board who are just so privileged to serve Vancouver Coastal as board members. Um, and many of them are here tonight: John McLaughlin, um, Wendy Al, Eob Nazki, Davis McKenzie, Chief Marilyn Slett from Bella Bella, Deborah Baker from the Squamish Nation, Kathy Greenberg. Um, and Margaret McGregor. And those are my board members that work with, with me and the senior team to make sure that we're doing our job and serving our community across the whole geography of Vancouver Coastal. So a big thank you to them and a, and a big thank you to the community who's on the phone tonight, so interested in what's going on and asking us questions and you know giving us your input on what's important to you. So the last poll question, um, basically is um, to help us plan future open board forums. We, we like to know more about what kinds of topics you want to hear about. We have a lot of information that we can talk about to you and we always have you know a limited amount of time. So it's important for us to try and understand what topics do you think are most important for us to prioritize during these open forums. So, to this question, you can press one if you think long-term and strategic planning throughout Vancouver Coastal is the most important, or you can press two if you actually would prefer just to hear about the current local, you know, health services issues or health issues in your community. Um, so tonight that would be in Richmond. And then press three if you want to hear more about public health. Um, public health is you know, an area that goes what we call upstream and tries to keep us from getting ill and take care of us when nasty viruses like COVID arrive. So press one if you would like to hear more about long-term and strategic planning throughout the Vancouver Coastal Health Geography. Press two if you like to hear just about the current local health service and health issues that are affecting your local community. And press three if you wish to hear more information about public health. So let's vote away and we'll see what your input is. Um, and, you know, while you're doing this, just want to give a big thank you to our hundreds of participants who have been with us tonight, for all of you who have asked such great questions to our many staff. We have over 30 staff who have been listening in and of course all our board members who have been listening to your input and to your worries and concerns and some of your suggestions tonight, very, very important. So the poll results for um, your input is 47% want to hear more about long-term strategic planning for Vancouver Coastal, about 45% want to hear about current local issues, and 6% want to hear more about public health. So I just really want to close tonight by thanking you for sharing that input with us. It'll be very important for us. And thank you for spending, you know, an important part of your evening with us. Just uh, really want to thank everybody for spending your evening with us. And we really appreciated hearing directly from you. Uh, we want to thank our speakers for their updates and the interpreters for helping us reach our residents. And we want to thank VCH staff in Richmond who are focused every day on delivering the best care possible. We're confident that every project that we discussed tonight will help us deliver great care to this growing community well into the future. 
Uh, ben, Penny, you're back. Do you want to make that last statement there? I I do. I just really thank you, Shannon. I my Zoom. I'm in the office building down on Broadway, and my Zoom keeps clicking out. So apologies for that. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Uh, we're we're working hard on your behalf. We really appreciate your input. And I'm going to thank everyone and declare on behalf of the board this meeting adjourned and wish you all a very good night. Thank you so much.